Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard. I'm going to be speaking with frequent guests here on Health Professional Radio, Dr. Lawrence Edwards. He's joining us to talk about the new 2020 American College of Rheumatology, or ACR, guidelines for the management of gout. He's uh, also the chairman of the Gout Education Society. That's a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to raising awareness of gout and providing some free educational materials to medical professionals and patients and caregivers as well. Welcome back, and um, thanks for coming back, Dr. Edwards. Uh, It's terrific to be back with you, Neil. Always a pleasure. Well, for any of our new listeners who may not be familiar with your uh, background, give us a brief uh, overview of your experience, and then talk about um, what gout is and who's affected. Sure. Um, I'm a physician uh, at the University of Florida. I've uh, been uh, doing research in the area of gout for the last 40 years. Uh, I'm a rheumatologist by uh, training. And um, like I say, it's, uh, it's been a long process and we're still pushing hard to just get physicians to cover the basics of this disease. Gout is the most common of all inflammatory arthritis. We hear a lot about rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis on TB today, but even if you add up all the patients with those two um, serious diseases, um, they wouldn't equal half the number of patients that have gout. So about 9 million plus um, in the United States uh, are suffering from gout, and it's a a potentially crippling, um, destructive form of arthritis that's caused by an elevation of serum uric acid in the blood. We've all heard of arthritis, and you know it, it conjures up pictures of this uh, progressive disease. There's there's no cure for arthritis. I mean, if you have it long enough and live long enough, it's going to lay you out flat. Is gout a form of arthritis that can be treated? Yes. As a matter of fact, most forms of arthritis can be treated, and the very dire outcomes that you were describing um, were the case when I started off in the field 40 years ago. But Mm -hmm. now most diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, and especially gout, can be treated uh, quite successfully in all the Uh, devastating complications of those diseases um, don't happen. The most common form of arthritis is um, in a different group. We call the ones I've been talking about, gout and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory arthritis. But the most common form of arthritis is osteoarthritis. And and that, uh, I'm sorry to say, doesn't have great treatments. Um, We certainly don't have a way of reversing the destruction, the degradation of cartilage and bone that occurs in these wear and tear types of arthritis. Well, you cleared up uh, one misconception about arthritis in general as to its treatability. What are some of the misconceptions about gout that can be cleared up quite quickly? Sure. Well, if you go on websites, uh, the, the Internet is full of of. Uh, um, recommendations on how to treat your gout with diet or abstaining from this food or that food or adding this particular uh, nutritional substance. And the truth is that gout is a genetic disease um, and virtually everybody with gout needs to be treated with with medications. Um, the initial drug is allopurinol. Um, to read these uh, websites, you would believe that if you just abstain from a certain number of foods, uh, including red meats and shellfish and and, and uh, fructose-containing sweet drinks and beer, uh, that you'll be all right. But that doesn't cure anybody, quite frankly. Um, even losing significant amount of weight it doesn't cure people. Uh, the problem is that these this dietary approach to the management of gout is pushed to the point that people believe that they don't have to do anything else. They don't have to check their uric acid. They don't have to be on a medication that can lower their uric acid. But we now know from multiple studies that the dietary component of it uh, is a relatively small contributor to the overall risk for gout. How do some of these beliefs about gout contribute to the compliance or the lack thereof when someone is given a treatment strategy? Well, there's a lot of mythology out there. So 
the general take on people with gout is that um, their disease is self-inflicted. They are overindulgent in something. Their lifestyle choices haven't been good. Uh, but that's simply not the case. Um, most patients with gout uh, can trace back in their family tree just a branch or two and find somebody uh, with the disease. Um, there is a relationship between flares of gout. Now, this isn't causation of gout. This isn't what's causing it. But if you have gout, what can cause it to flare might be a, a night on the town with uh, a, a big... Uh, 18 ounce steak and a couple of glasses of beer and and uh, you might wake up in the middle of the night having problems then mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, again isn't the cause of gout uh, gout is caused by a patient a person's kidneys just not keeping pace with getting rid of the uric acid in the blood is this something that builds up from childhood or does it start in adult uh, early adulthood when should we start worrying or considering that gout could become a problem later on in life well it varies between men and women uh, so um, again most people that get gout are genetically predisposed uh, and for men we believe that they uh, attain their quote, adult level of uric acid, um, you know, what their peak is going to be sometime around puberty. So as children, both men and women have very low levels of uric acid, uh, and that's in the two to three range. But as males go through puberty, they attain their adult level. And, and if they're genetically predisposed to have elevated uric acid levels and eventually go on to get gout, it shows up when they're 14, 15, 15. But it takes decades of slowly accumulating the crystals that are formed by having too much uric acid in your blood around the joint. So sometime in the 30s or 40s, um, the patient will have their first episode of gout. And then if untreated, they'll go on and progressively over the next decade have more frequent flares and the flares will last longer and will have a more destructive effect on the bone. Now, women, on the other hand, are protected to some degree by um, estrogen uh, in their early years. So uh, their uric acid levels stay down through most of their early adulthood. But then as they pass into menopause and lose that estrogen's effect on the kidney, which promotes uric acid to be eliminated, and as they lose that potential, um, they also develop their highest, their adult level of uric acid and can go on and accumulate crystals. And so instead of men who might get their gout in their 30s or 40s or 50s, women tend to get it in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Have the guidelines for the management and treatment of, of gout changed significantly here in recent uh, recent years? No, actually, uh, we do. You did mention at the start of the show that there is a new set of guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology uh, that just came out a couple of months ago, and they're not substantially different than the American College of Rheumatology guidelines that were released in 2012. Um, the core of, of both sets of guidelines is that there's a treat-to-target uh, imperative. So. Uh, if you have gout, you should be on a uric acid lowering drug, and your target should be to get your uric acid level down to less than six. If you have more advanced disease with evidence of bony destruction on x ray or evidence of accumulated masses of uric acid around your joints, then you should decrease your target even lower so that maybe dropping the uric acid level down to less than five would be the right idea. Right, right. Um, and that's the same uh, gospel that's being <laughs> preached with the 2020 um, guidelines. The difference is in the interim, the American College of Physicians, uh, the group of primary care physicians in the country, came out with their own set of gout guidelines and said, well, that's all nice what the rheumatologists are saying, but where is the hard proof that all of this is necessary? And they ended up making the recommendation that it's not important to measure uric acids and they wouldn't recommend 
necessarily even treating people with gout with uric acid lowering therapy because um, their guidelines needed to strict you know, strictly stick to um, uh, strong evidence in the literature mm-hmm. and so despite that over the years there has been accumulated strong evidence that this treat to target approach that the rheumatologists have been promoting uh, is now available. And so the guidelines are coming out and just with all the scientific support that the, uh, that the primary care physicians were asking for is now evident. And, uh, and that's why these guidelines are important. Right. Well, give us a website in closing where our listeners can get more information about gout and about the guidelines for, uh, for treatment and management. Sure. So uh, the Gout Education Society's website uh, is online at goutteducation.org. Uh, I do encourage you to go to it and spend some time on it. Uh, it has some very important information and helps disprove a lot of the myths surrounding the, the disease gout. Well, always a pleasure to speak with you, and I'm sure we'll be speaking again, uh, especially um, during these times as um, they're ever-changing. So I'm sure that uh, medical <laughs> guidelines and just about everything are going to change you know, in the, in the future. So um, I'm looking forward to speaking with you again. Always a pleasure, Neil. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. N. Lawrence Edwards. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au.